guys, I'm Sam Rollins. I'm the last talk before lunch, so I'm going to make this as fast as I can. Um, and I'm not sure I'm, not, I'm going to take questions because I, I really am eager to get to lunch. And uh, um, th this, I may have packed more than I, I should have into this. So my talk is going to be on a new feature in Ruby 2.1 called tracing object allocations. Uh, it's super exciting. So Ruby 2.1 is out. Um, raise your hand if you've installed it or used any new features in Ruby 2.1. Awesome. This is like, that's a better adoption than Ruby 1.9 when it came out. Um, so you can grab it with RBM. RVM, of course, they both um, allow you to grab it. Here's the news file um, of all the features. And what I'm going to talk about is this little guy in the corner, object space trace object allocations. So object space is not new. You may have used like count objects, each object. It's where the garbage collect method is. Um, but they've added a couple new methods in 2.1, trace object allocations, and then a couple sibling functions, start, stop, clear. So let's start off with an anecdote from GitHub. That's kind of where this story begins. They have a blog post called, uh, Hey Judy, Don't Make It Bad. And they kind of tell the story of when they fire up the GitHub app and immediately count how many objects are in memory and referenceable, there's more than 600,000 Ruby objects hanging out. This is way more than they they thought should be the case. Um, so this was a mystery. And at the time, there, aren't any, there weren't any great ways to profile memory. And they're kind of, up until Ruby 2.1, there, there weren't any good ones. Um, I think memprof was a good one for Ruby 1.8, which didn't work in Ruby 1.9. And this is kind of, there's been a void here. There's great um, SQL profiling tools, CPU profiling tools, but this is, there's been a gap here. So, so this is kind of what we're trying to solve, is where am I supposedly hogging all this memory? So enter trace object allocations. Let's look at an example. We have a simple class here with an, a, a method that returns an array, so it allocates and returns an array, and then another method that allocates and returns a string. And I want to trace um, my object allocations. So what we can do is, sorry, is we can call some code here. We're gonna, we're gonna, the, the, the two lines in the middle there are the important ones where we say, I'm going to uh, save this, the, this return value from an array into the variable A, and then I'm going to save my class new a string into the S variable, and I want to trace this code. So you wrap that code in a block and pass it to trace object allocations. And then what you're provided is a couple other helper methods in object space that can tell you what file allocated this object, my A object, and what line was it allocated on, and what class and what method are the kind of allocation sites for this little object, my little A variable here. So that's pretty cool. It tells you example 3.rb, um, it tells you my class, it tells you line 3. There's also an alternate method, so if, if it's a little kludgy to wrap your code in a block that you wanted to trace, you can also just call al trace ob object allocation start, run your code, and then call stop, and you get the same functionality. So why, why are we doing this? Why is this interesting? In general, we want to do two things. We can reduce the memory footprint here. That was GitHub's big thing there. They, right when they start up, they have all these objects, and they do not want all those objects. Um, so this can help performance in, in your applications. And then it can also help reduce garbage collection time. So if you have fewer objects, um, garbage collection will just run faster. Um, specifically marking and sweeping. So even if these are tiny objects, even if it's a bunch of empty arrays or small strings, one character strings, um, this will reduce marking and sweeping um, in garbage collection. So you say, but my application isn't on Ruby 2.1. This is no, no use of, to me. That's okay. It's a diagnostic tool. If you can get your app to run locally in Ruby 2.1, then you can play around with this stuff and get some information out. You don't need to bump your production application to Ruby 2.1 to use this. Um, so what we just saw there, that example, Trace object allocations is pretty limited. I have to have a handle on an object and say, this, this variable, Ruby, tell me where it came from, and it can tell you. And that's super limited. You don't have little handles on all your, on all your objects at any one place. Um, it's also very fine-grained, so it's only going to tell you information about each object. But it's just the start. I think this is super exciting. So we can start to write tools around this um, to get better information about our apps as a whole. So the next step is aggregation. Um, I've got a gem called Allocation Stats. It, of course, requires Ruby 2.1. It requires that new feature to get going. Uh, let's look at an example of, of how this works. So we have a class that has a method. On line three, it's going to allocate a hash, and we have three string keys or three string values there on line three. On line four, we allocate another string. 
So all we're going to do is require allocation stats. And then line 10 has my class new my method. And we're going to wrap that in a block and pass it to allocation stats.trace. So very similar API to the, the basic Ruby, uh, the basic library API. And then we're going to um, call the allocations in that stats object. And to text gives us this nice tabular output. So here we can see on line four, we allocated a string um, in, and the, the class path and method were my class and my method. On line three, we allocated that hash and the three string values. And line 10, you can see we allocated a new instance of my class. So remember from the previous talk, each time you call dot new, first it allocates memory and then it calls the initialize method. So we're allocating my class objects as well when we, when we run this code. So again, we have not aggregated results yet, so let's group by. We have the same code here, same code here. This time, we're going to group by source file, source line, and class. So now this tabular output is going to have allocations, but they're going to be grouped by those three, those three fields. So we can see here, we've now grouped those three strings that we allocated on line three. It's, it's showing that three strings were allocated, and so that's kind of there in that table, much more useful than seeing each individual allocation. Let's look at a more complicated example. Psych is a really fun one. So this is, again, the, uh, the YAML parsing library in uh, the standard Ruby library. Here's like almost the most basic example I could think of. We're going to take an array of two strings, and dump it to YAML, and see what happens when, when we run that code. So we're going to wrap that in a call to trace the, the allocations. We're gonna, this time, I'm going to group by source file and then the class of the objects being allocated. And this is what we get. Um, so first, we see at the top there, there were 38 strings allocated in visitor. Uh, there were five match datas. That's the result of a, a regex match in visitor.rb. And we see more. You see down further below, there's 12 arrays being allocated in YAML tree. So these aren't sorted yet. Let's make it a little more useful. We'll, group by, we'll call the same code. We'll group by source file and class again. This time, let's sort it. And now we can see our top allocation sites there are uh, 38 strings from visitor and 21 strings and 12 arrays from YAML tree. And if you want, you can group those by line and see where the lines are. And I, I see this, and I'm just like super interested. Like, I want to dump an array of two little strings to YAML. And you get all these allocations in visitor. Like, that's just super interesting to see like, what is going on in, in that visitor file. And it, it could be all necessary. Um, I found that a lot, that a lot of this is like accidental necessary code. Um, but it's interesting. Class plus is a cool little feature where we can dive in um, and group by, group by something, something more special. So here we're using the hike library, and the hike gem is um, kind of the core of sprockets, where it's, you can tell the hike library, here's a subdirectory, give me all the files that match this pattern. So here we're actually looking at hike's um, own directory, and uh, we're going to search for all the RB files. And again, group by source file and class plus this time. And now you can see we have a couple um, more interesting results. It'll, it'll, so class plus will show you that online, uh, or in kernel require, there were 134 allocations of arrays. And all of those arrays uh, were just arrays of fixed nums and falses. So if, if, there, if the members are limited to a, a couple classes, it'll, it'll give you that information. So um, maybe that's not terribly interesting. But uh, the second one, you see these are arrays of strings. So strings themselves are also allocations. And the third one is arrays of arrays. Um, so this, this is kind of interesting. What looks a little weird here, though, is that I'm in the hike gem. I was kind of curious about what the hike gem does. And all my top allocation sites here are in Ruby gems kernel require. That's super surprising. And, and I don't want to look in kernel require. I'm not interested in that. So, What's actually happening here is, and then we also have some Ruby VM instruction sequences uh, in the top sites there. So what's happening here is I think the hike gem uh, uses autoload. And so it is, even though I require hike before tracing, the hike gem itself is using autoload. And whatever libraries it's, it's loading are loaded after I've begun tracing. And so we get all these ugly stats here. So to solve that, we can burn one. This is like in poker, burning a card. So if we call burn one and then give it this same block, then it's going to run the block once without tracing. It doesn't care about what happened. Then it's going to run the block a second time tracing. And now we get much cleaner output. We see the, the top allocation site is in path name, which makes sense for this, this uh, library that, that looks around paths. Uh, running inside your specs is a cool feature. 
So if you're kind of thinking like, I like my, you know, is my gem or is my is a library that I use like using a lot of objects that it doesn't need to allocate? So and then where do I start that investigation? So in the, at the top of your spec helper, if you're using RSpec, and I'd love to put this into other spec uh, tools, you can require allocation stats and tell it to trace RSpec, and you'll get this result. So here I'm tracing uh, the mail gem. The mail gem has incredible test coverage. They have a lot of tests. So um, I just included that at the top, and I ran the specs. There were a ton of specs. And you get the top 10 allocation sites. So the first one there is string allocations in utilities, line 180. And you can see which spec uh, featured the most allocations for that line. So attachments list spec, and then you get a line that's, that's cut off. That had 4,639 allocations of, of strings. It's maybe a little weird, like, is this a huge spec? It kind of seems like it doesn't, maybe doesn't need to be, like message spec. These seem like they should be unit tests. Uh, and then you see, so you get the top examples, and then the next allocation site is arrays being allocated in received parser, and you get some more of that, and you get this long list. Uh, and then from there, you can, like, go crazy and try and reduce, reduce allocations, and we'll, we'll see some ways to reduce allocations in a bit. So uh, this was super interesting. I sent them a pull request reducing allocations by a significant amount. Um, it was, it's super fun to, to go through a library and, and do this. So this helps reduce object churn. This is kind of the biggest um, cost of garbage collection. This is a known um, computer science-y thing is that in, in Java and Ruby and these languages with garbage collectors, most objects are young objects. They die as young objects. And so you get a lot of object churn. And this is the, the difficulty in garbage collection is, is quickly uh, collecting young objects. Um, especially in, if you have a rack app, um, those, those per request allocations, right? So you have a request coming in, it goes through your entire rack pipeline into your Rails pipeline, you're generating a response coming out, it's generating all these strings and objects and querying the database, generating thousands of allocations, and then as soon as your response goes out, they're all garbage, they're all, they're all worthless, unless you're kind of like, unless these are like memoized objects. Um, so we also have rack allocation stats, is another excellent tool. So it's a rack middleware. If you have a rack app that maybe sits here, um, it responds to, to this request, maybe my rack app, port 9292, at a path with some parameters. You can add ras trace equals true, ras for rack allocation stats. And then instead of uh, sending you back the response that you were expecting, it's going to give you, um, yeah, so let's look at this. It's going to give you those sites. It's going to give you the top sites. So let's look at an example. Uh, this is a super simple Sinatra app. It responds to one path at ERB. It's going to parse this ERB down here, and it's going to say hello world in six languages. Very simple app. Um, and let's, let's see what happens. So here, it's super washed out at the top, but this is like the normal app, just the slash ERB path. You see hello world in six languages. If I add ras trace equals true, this is the response I get. So we see the top allocation sites. By default, it's by file. It groups them by file, line, and class plus. So you see like the seventh one down, that it's allocating 15 arrays of strings. Um, so this is a way to like trace your rack apps. There's a couple of features. If you pass in ras help, it'll give you, it'll respond with help text in the browser. Uh, Alias paths equals true helps with super long uh, absolute file paths. So you see the top ones there. Uh, ERB is in the Ruby Libder, so it's just going to alias that for you. Uh, like the sixth line down is the Sinatra 133 gem. Further down, there's present working directory. So that kind of helps. I can squish it onto this tiny slide. Uh, RAS times equals 10 helps you kind of with, it's similar to burning, you can also do burning, um, but if you have like non-deterministic allocations, if there's any randomality, um, then you can, or caching, then you can pass in times equals 10 and the middleware will fire off your request into, the, into your app 10 times, tracing the entire time so you get the summary output. You can also output to JSON. RAS output equals interactive is a super fun thing. Let's look at an example of that. Okay, so here's my app again. Um, so if I pass uh, ras trace equals true and ras output equals interactive, we get this JavaScript app. So this is super nice. Instead of like playing with the with the request headers there, we can just 
It'll, we can get all our requests back and group them as we wish. So right now they're grouped by file, line, and class plus. And you can see the top offender there. I can instead group by file and class plus. You can filter out things like, oh, I'm only curious about the gems I'm using, so don't you know, filter out the project. Um, you can also see that there's a long tail here of allocations. I do not care about these individual allocation sites. So uh, you can say, only, a, um, only show me groups with at least this many allocations. So if we pump this up to like 10, now here's a nice super short list. I, I think that I have a simple Sinatra app, and yet here's a bunch of allocation sites that are allocating more than 10 objects per line number, like file and line number combination. And that's super interesting, and now maybe you have a short list of things to investigate. So this is a really fun uh, piece of rack allocation stats. So what do I do with all this? I've showed you like how to trace your allocations, um, but what's, what's useful about this? Okay, the goal is to allocate less, right? So you say, how do I allocate less? Well, that depends. Um, there's a bunch of different ways. It's not always simple, but we can go through some, some examples. So here's an example from the temple gem. They, are, uh, they used to be adding one array to another with plus equals. So keys plus equals h dot keys. And you can see that this is a short-lived array. So keys is an array that's generated by the inject method, and you're not going to damage anything by, destructing the, by using a destructive method and concatenating directly to that array. So I replace that code with keys.concat h keys, and it's allocating one less array every loop through inject there. And the Ruby documentation is super good about this, actually, especially in string and array and some of those base classes. They will tell you that plus allocates a new array and then appends, and concat appends the second array to this array. Uh, memoization is another great way. Um, you kind of have to you know, use this sparingly. Don't, don't memoize too much because you get some memory bloat. But especially in string building, we'll see some examples of where memoizing can help reduce allocations. String freeze. Uh, got a super exciting feature in Ruby 2.1. So this, you would need to take advantage of this. You would need to actually bump to Ruby 2.1. Um, string literals, when freeze is called on them, will always refer to the same object. So this, this modification is actually to the Ruby parser, uh, where if, if it parses out you know, quotes and text and no interpolation and, and, and quotes dot freeze, it's going to save that as one object. Um, so this is, this is very different in old Ruby. So let's look at an example. This top method here, no freeze, uh, where I'm trimming, or translating, sorry, translating spaces into quotes. Every time you enter this method, Ruby looks and says, oh, oh, I have a space string, so let me, let me allocate that, and I have an underscore string, and I'll allocate that, and not frozen, let me allocate that. And then it kind of futzes with your string and returns a value, and those all die. And then the next time you call no freeze, all those objects are allocated again, and they, they die because they're super young. If you freeze in Ruby 2.1, it's gonna, that, that, that's going to reference the same object every run through. So it creates the object at parse time, I think, or maybe, maybe it's the first time the method is called, and then it will refer to the same object. It will not allocate that object every run through. So here we have some benchmarks. Um, using the no freeze method, this, uh, I think I did eight, I called this eight million times, um, took nine seconds using, you know, without freezing those strings, and it took seven, seven seconds freezing those strings. Um, and you can see there were far fewer allocations. And then that second to last column is the time spent in GC was almost cut in half uh, when, when I, I don't throw all these horrible short-lived tiny one-character strings at the garbage collector. Um, if you're curious, like, will this slow down calling the freeze method on a 2.0 app or a 1.9 app? Um, it slows it down slightly, so... But, but not dramatically, and actually garbage collection stays the same. So an even better method than this, and an even prettier method, because it's hideous putting dot .freeze everywhere, is save your you know, quotes, space quotes, as a constant outside the method. So you have your space constant, your underscore constant, which actually is probably better syntactically anyways, um, to have these, these as objects if you're translating. The mail jam constantly translates new lines into different things. Um, so that's a way to re reduce allocations. Rails 3.2 has some horrific uh, allocation sites. So here's a super tiny uh, Rails 3.2 app. I literally created, I said Rails new, and then I generated two models. A project has many tasks. A project has a name and a description, and a task has a name and a description. And then this page 
loads a total, it should load a total of 100 stringy or texty, like stringy fields. So that's how many, how many fields I, I feel like should be retrieved from the database and maybe may allocated in order to generate this. So what do we actually get? We get 756 strings from active record relation, 707 strings from active support callbacks, 300 strings from SQLite3 statement. And that one, that one doesn't seem so bad. I was expecting 100 stringy fields to be retrieved from the database, and it generated 332 strings. Maybe there's some factor of three that it kind of needs, needs to generate these strings for. Well, you'd have to look to kind of find out if there's something horribly offensive in there. So let's look at these, these various uh, sites. Active support callbacks, uh, this is where you're creating callbacks in um, like helper methods in, so active support callbacks is used in active model and the controller for, for various callbacks, filters, um, validators. And so every time you call a callback, it, it builds the callback's name that it needs to run. And it, so it's doing all this interpolation. Line 414 generates a method uh, and line 81 there generates a method that it's sending to. So this is, your, once your Rails app, if, if you're using Active Support in a Rails app, is launched, there's a static number of callbacks that you're going to use, right? So this is kind of terrifying that this is generating these strings every time. And the fix is, of course, to uh, cache them or memoize them. So in Rails 4, they turn this into a thread-safe cache, and um, you don't generate callback names every single time a request comes in and needs to, needs to call any kind of uh, callbacks. Very good. Okay, active record relation. This one's pretty awful as well. Um, we see in initialize, so every single time you call a relation, you call dot where, you call dot not, you call any of these uh, active record relation generating methods, it's calling initialize, which is running through these arrays, and the instance variable set is not the offensive part, it's the it's string interpolation there, right? So we have v as a string, and then it needs to build a new string, turning it into an instance variable. And every single time you create a new relation, it's going through those 20 items in those arrays, and it's instantiating little tiny strings that are immediately thrown away as soon as instance variable set is called, and causing a lot of garbage collection. So the um, result here in Rails 4, this file is just kind of entirely refactored, and this problem goes away. Um, they do nothing like this in, in Rails 4. It's not always easy to fix these. Here's a tag from, active, act, from Action View's uh, tag helper. So anytime you call like form tag, input tag, button tag, image tag, uh, link to, they all kind of boil down to calling tag. And tag is just, all it's going to do is, he, is he's trying to build an HTML tag. So he starts with a left bracket, and then the name of the tag, and then some other things. And then maybe a closing bracket, but maybe a slash closing bracket. So every single time, you're generating your massively complicated view in an app, and it needs to build every single HTML tag in that page. It's creating a string for the open bracket and all of that jazz. And then the close bracket, it's also generating the slash close bracket. At every single time, and then those needs to get thrown away. This could be uh, fixed with freeze. I have not benchmarked that, but I imagine um, these should be constantized, the, the end close bracket and the whack end close bracket. Those should be constantized, and that'll reduce allocations by a lot. Um, let's see. So this is SQLite statement. This is where there were 300 objects being allocated, and we kind of wanted just 100. So if we look through this, uh, what do we have here? We have the, the, the offensive line was line 108, val equals step. Step is not a local variable in this method, so it must be a method, but when you look for it, you can't find the method in this file. Where is step? It turns out it's in the C extension, in SQLite. So there, it is you know, entirely possible to find where the strings are being allocated in that function, but they might be calling you know, further C functions, and that was a rabbit hole that I decided not to go down. I thought 300 isn't terribly offensive over 100, um, but that would be probably super exciting. Maybe, maybe it doesn't need to allocate so many strings. So be excited. Um, these gems are changing. I think the, the more tools should come out for this new feature. And um, this, is, this is kind of just the beginning, because this is you know, the first time we've had a great uh, memory profiling tool like this. Um, beware of your object allocations. Beware of how much garbage collection costs you. I think an easy one is like when you're chaining enumerable methods, like dot .select, dot .select, dot .select. Use some bang methods in there so you're not creating new enumerables each time. Um, add trace object allocations to your toolbox. 
and watch this space for more exciting things. Um, if you're interested in this stuff, there are some great things to Google. The GitHub blog post is super interesting. You can read the end of that story, how they fixed that problem and what they kind of found was the problem. Uh, it's called Hey Judy, Don't Make It Bad. Um, these are my two gems. Koichi Sasada's Efficient 2.1 is a talk he's given a few times, so you can find a video of it um, when he gave it at Yoroku and Ruby Kaigi, and he gave kind of a version of it at RubyConf this year. Um, it's super interesting. It's more focused on the new garbage collector in 2.1, but he does touch on, on this feature. Uh, I want to say thanks to Aman Gupta. He actually originally wrote the feature because that blog post there kind of, kind of shows how he wrote this. He, did the thing where you fork uh, Ruby and you add your own patch to try and find where you're doing your allocations. And then he got it merged in with Koichi into, into Ruby Core. GitHub for everything they do. My coworker, Matt Brooks, Mountain West RubyConf. Thanks, Mike. And Hakeem, this presentation is made with Reveal. That's everything. Um, if you do want to talk about this later, because you all want to get to lunch, I think I'm going to be eating at Stone Ground. All right. Thank you. That yeah. was always wonderful.